Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. Uh, here we are in uh, this new year, a couple months into it, and uh, we can rejoice because the point of The Journey Home program is to demonstrate that the Holy Spirit continues to be working. The Holy Spirit continues to touch hearts and minds of men and women with the grace to awaken them to the beauty of Jesus Christ in his church. It continues. The work goes on. Sometimes you look around, you wonder, in our culture, where is it going? Mm -hmm. But in the midst of that, the Holy Spirit is alive and well, and we see that happening. And tonight's a uh, proof of that. Our guests are Matt and Elizabeth Akers. I don't always have a couple on the program, but it's a joy to have both of them on. They're former Anglicans. How about if I shave both your hands like this? <laughs> Welcome to the program. It's great to have you here. Thank you. Great to be here. And uh, I also feel kind of interesting because I got somebody here with a bigger beard than me. <laughs> <laughs> Been working on it for a year. I'm, I'm just a novice. <laughs> but, but welcome to the journey home. It's a great pleasure to have you here. And uh, I'm going to get out of the way real quick, but I'm not sure which of you flipped the coin that would start first. I think I'll start. All right. All right, Matt. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, th thank you again for having us here. We're just honored to be on the program. Um, my, my journey started very early on. I was raised in a very devoutly Christian home. Uh, my father was a uh, fundamentalist, Bible-believing minister, and uh, graduated from Bob Jones University. Whoa. And, uh, and I had, uh, th there are many parts of my upbringing I'm very thankful for and th yep. that I still am, am grateful to him the way he raised me. Uh, very strong uh, respect for scripture, uh, very strong uh, insistence on church attendance. Uh, we were, um, you know, taught that prayer was very important. Uh, and have a, still to this day, I, I think I could say I have a very good grounding in Scripture because of, of my yeah. father's influence. And I was um, going to say, sometimes we take this for granted, but really that means that you were brought up looking at the world, that the reality is it came from God. Yes, yes, very much so. And a lot of our decisions were based on um, what, what did the Word of God say? That was a common question in the home. So yeah. I'm very thankful for that. Um, uh, on the other hand, there, there were some um, things that were uh, maybe not, not the best in, in, in that uh, very fundamentalist um, upbringing. And, you know, one of them, um, my, my father had um, uh, married my mom and, and uh, she passed away when I was one and a half years old. Oh, so wow. um, I had, uh, three, he had three teenagers and, and myself as an infant um, on his hands. And, so by that time, my father had actually uh, taken a job with a Christian publishing company, and he was supplying pulpits. And so when he was doing that, we bounced around to a lot of different churches because he was supplying pulpits. But the churches tended to be um, small and had a lot of uh, elderly people in them. And I never developed a network of, of people my own age. And because, again, as, as, as fundamentalists, we, um, in, in some ways, I'm, I'm glad we did, but we, we pulled back from a lot of, of popular culture as well. So I never really had a, a network of, of young friends um, and people to support me yeah. in the faith. And so that, that uh, uh, idea of the community of, of, of saints and, and faith and everything never really developed that. Uh, and uh, on the, the other side of it, um, I, I recognized pretty early on that, that questioning anything wasn't, uh, was not good. And I was uh, always a, uh, a reader. I don't know that I would say I'm a deep thinker, but I, I am a thinker, and, and I like to uh, talk about ideas and discuss them. And I recognized very early on that was, that was considered a sign almost of, of unbelief or uh, that you didn't have faith. Or rebellion. Or rebellion, yes. And so um, those two things, it, it, it really came to a head for me by the time I hit high school. And I did rebel uh, against Christianity. And um, I had a couple years there where I really didn't want anything to do with the faith. And had you actually gotten cognitively to envision a world that God didn't exist? Had you gotten to that point? Or no, just pushing it over? I think it was, it was a lot on my side, ignorance. I didn't okay. realize the arguments for Christianity. Um, again, I, I had been raised with a very strong knowledge of the Bible, but there wasn't a whole lot of relating that scriptural knowledge to anything else. Okay. And so I picked up a book. Uh, during my senior year in high school, I, I started to come back to the faith, and I picked up, um, I had read C.S. Lewis as a young boy, Chronicles of Narnia, and I started reading C.S. Lewis because there I began to see a Christianity that had roots and that had connections with the, yeah. the broader world. And I, I still remember, I, I picked up a copy of um, 
Athanasius's on the incarnation of the word. And the only reason I did that, I had no idea who Athanasius was, <laughs> but I picked it up because C.S. Lewis had written an introduction and it came up in, the, in those days in the card catalog. And I said, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to read this. And I read Lewis's introduction and I thought this sounds fascinating. I had no knowledge of the church fathers. I had no knowledge of the historic development of the faith, uh, the development of doctrine, as, as Newman yeah. would say. I had no, no idea of any of that. And I, I read Athanasius and that just um, opened my mind mm -hmm. up to uh, a Christianity that was um, far beyond this age and that reached back uh, thousands of years, right? And, and, and uh, you know, that it, it just really opened my eyes. And so um, at, at that point, uh, I, was, I was going into uh, university and I decided on majoring in English and I was a huge fan of, of English literature. And um, along with that, I began reading some English theology. Obviously, you know, C.S. Lewis, but I started uh, reading uh, Oh, poets like John Donne and George Herbert and started reading a little bit more of their theological works and then going into the 19th century I was reading uh, John Henry Newman, I was reading Gerard Manley Hopkins' uh, letter to his father and about his conversion from Anglicanism to Catholicism. But at that point I was really focused more on uh, Anglicanism because uh, while it had both the, those historic connections I was looking for theologically or historically but also then with my love of English literature it was a natural connection. And so my uh, senior year in, in, uh, uh, at the university, I needed to make a decision here, what was I going to do next? And I uh, had been going, um, I should back up a little bit and say during college, I found a church called the Reformed Episcopal Church. Mm -hmm. And um, it was totally uh, you know, foreign to me, again, any type of, of church with a liturgy or anything, but I went to this Reformed Episcopal Church and uh, they, they were uh, uh, one of the breakaway bodies from the Episcopal Church, known as um, uh, conservative, but also very evangelical. Mm. And as, as I uh, got into the church, I realized that they were using kind of a revision of the 1662 Book of Common Prayer. So it had the Elizabethan English in it. Uh, they still use the King James Version that I was raised in in the Fundamentalist uh, <laughs> Church. And so there were some natural connections there, and it started um, developing more and more of, of a love for uh, kind of classical Anglicanism, if you will, but still very, very low church on the evangelical yep. side of right. things. And during my senior year in, in college, I decided um, to attend a small Reformed Episcopal seminary, uh, Cramner Theological House, named after Thomas Cramner, right. the, the English reformer. And when I, when I went there, I wasn't sure if I was called to the ministry or not, but I knew that I wanted the, the theological education because I did feel that I was lacking some of that from my, from my upbringing on the historical side of things. And I went to Cramner House and it was very interesting when I got there because there was a, um, certainly formally I guess, or officially there was a low church emphasis, but a number of the students there were um, kind of more um, Catholic leaning in their Anglicanism, so high church. And I, I could sense that even though I didn't know a whole lot about that, I could sense the division almost immediately. And, and I remember just another brief story where uh, I was talking with one of the students and many of the students were a little bit older than I was. It was a lot of, of men who had gone to a career and then kind of come back. And so they were older and wiser. And he uh, made a comment to me about the mother of God. And I recoiled a little bit. And uh, he said, maybe you should uh, go read the Council of Ephesus says, um, because at, at Cramner House, a lot of the uh, people there accepted kind of the first four right. ecumenical councils. Right. The, the last three were a little shady uh, <laughs> for some, but um, he, yeah, he said, right. that's, that's historic. Funny. That's not some modern development or some you know, um, Roman Catholic doctrine. That's, that's very uh, ancient in the church's usage. And so that was another, I, I did. I went back and I looked at the Council of Ephesus and I said, oh, that, that, is, that is true. And um, that began, you know, th th that was an instance where I started looking at some of my preconceived notions. And I, I said, you know, um, I, I think that I've been misinformed and I really better learn a little bit um, before I make some of these judgments. And so during my time at Cramner House then, I continued to read and, and got, uh, took liturgics and began to understand the Book of Common Prayer and, and again also had this, this kind of Anglican Catholic influence there, Anglican mm -hmm. High Church influence that made me much more open eventually to uh, you know, Catholicism. And so um, after my second year at, at Cramner House um, or during my second year, I decided 
that I would not go on for ordination, but that I would get the academic degree, uh, which was a two-year program, and so um, I completed that. And I headed um, back to Ohio for, um, I, I was, had applied to graduate school out in New Jersey, but I was going to spend the summer uh, in Ohio. Um, and that is when um, I, I came back to Ohio, and uh, again, I'd been uh, away for two years. And I needed a, a summer job between the end of seminary and the beginning of graduate school. And so I was working at a job where I actually had to work Sunday mornings and I couldn't make the Reformed Episcopal Church, but there was a church that I had been um, in Ohio also that was uh, um, a much higher church, uh, Anglican parish. And um, actually the, the rector at the Reformed Episcopal Church said, well, just go there. That it's, it's you know, they're, they're, they're pretty Catholic leaning there, but it's still okay, it's Anglican, so go there. <laughs> uh, and so I did, and that is where um, I, I very much enjoyed the, the theology and the liturgy, the liturgy of the church. But um, I also met um, a young woman named Elizabeth um, at, at that church. So I think I'll, I'll hand off the uh, baton to her for a moment and let her talk about it. <laughs> yeah, I don't mean to interrupt you too. I hate to come between a husband and his wife. But, <laughs> but I just wanted to comment that yeah. as you were describing that, cracks me up because I've been reading in the background Ian Carr's wonderful biography of Newman, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is fantastic. Mm -hmm. But what you're talking about reminds me of the battle he was going through mm -hmm. in the Oxford movement. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. I mean, there you are yes. at Cranmer, mm -hmm. yeah. almost 150 years later, mm -hmm. right? Same exact battles Yes. between high church, low church in the Anglican church. Almost like you don't talk to those people over there, too yeah. Catholic. Right? Yeah. And we actually had a course on the Oxford movement at Cranmer House, and it was interesting to watch students take both sides, <laughs> right. for and against. So, uh, Matt and Elizabeth Akers are our guests today, and so now we're going to hear the other side of the story. <laughs> <laughs> well, I grew up um, in uh, Medina, Ohio, and um, was raised in a, the tiny little Anglican church that uh, Matt just referred to. Um, my parents were left behind by the Episcopal Church when it went haywire, um, and so the best they could find in the area was this Anglican Catholic Church. My father is a 1928 Book of Common Prayer Episcopalian. He always will be, um, as far as he's <laughs> concerned. Um, he's very much historically Anglican in his family. Um, he's very tied into the Anglicanism that runs through American history, Episcopalianism actually, that runs through American history. So we were dyed in the wool Anglicans, but we had to go to this Anglican Catholic parish. Um, and our priests were far too high church for my parents. And I can remember uh, fiery homilies being delivered from the front of the church about regular Sunday uh, mass obligation and all of that. And my father rolling his eyes and, you know, um, we, we went when we, when we went and, and my parents raised us with a very strong, um, faith and a very strong conviction of um, the truth of Western Christendom. There was no question about that, but, you know, Sunday Mass obligation was not, that's not an Episcopalian thing. Um, so I uh, went to college, I went to a, an evangelical high school where I was also very much encouraged in my faith. I'm grateful for those um, mm -hmm. six years of junior high and high school. Um, I then went to um, a college uh, on the East Coast um, that did not encourage my faith and where I found myself very much mm. seeking my Anglican roots. And mm. the first year I was able to have a car, um, I found a traditional Episcopal church, as it was called. Wasn't terribly happy there for a lot of reasons, um, and so ended up driving from Annapolis, Maryland, into D.C., um, well, into Alexandria every Sunday uh, to go, or as many Sundays as I could, to go to Mass at an Anglican church there, um, and was so happy to have returned to the, um, the Anglican Missal and all of the things that I loved <laughs> about it. I, I never really found myself questioning my faith. Um, there were times my faith was challenged with what I was reading. I was at a great book school. We were reading some very difficult works, yep. um, Spinoza and Nietzsche and um, Hegel and some, some stuff that was really causing me to struggle, but it was from the perspective of, 
I know this is right, how do I answer <laughs> what I'm reading? And mm -hmm. so I'm sure that my college didn't appreciate my approach to what I was learning, <laughs> um, but that was very much my approach. Oddly, I did, I did have cause to question one summer when I lived. Um, I basically bounced from basements to attics through college and law school. And um, I would live in someone's basement and then I would go live in someone's attic. And uh, one basement that I was living in happened to belong to an apostolic lady who was just sweet and wonderful. And I went to church with her one Sunday and found myself saying, uh-oh, what if this is right? And I sort of said that from a, from a variety of perspectives. Um, but I, I came home and said to my dad, you know, we need to talk. What if this is right? And my dad <laughs> kind of looked at me and we talked our way through it. But again, it was from a very historical perspective. Yeah. It was Anglicanism and the truth of Episcopalianism. And, you know, um, it, it was never really the question, is the apostolic church correct? It was, why is Anglicanism an answer to this, you know? In the apostolic church you're talking about, <clears throat> it's not apostolic with a capital A. No, you know, charismatic. Charismatic, Pentecostal. Pentecostal you know, the it's a it's a modern Protestant movement that's going back to Acts chapter two. You know, exactly. You know, this is it's, how we believe the church was back then. Yes, but very charismatic worship. And but the issue <laughs> is, are they the direct descendants of the truth of it or not? Exactly, and that's where my father stepped in and explained that historically speaking, this could could not be correct, um, and allayed my fears. Um, so anyway, I, I continued um, with my undergraduate and um, got a job at a small classical Christian school in Roanoke, Virginia. And to some extent, my heart will always be in Roanoke, Virginia. I loved it there <laughs> and it was beautiful. The people were amazing. Um, the church was really, so the, the school where I taught was really solid. And I was going to a wonderful Anglican church um, in town. Couldn't have been happier, but then I got a call from my old Latin teacher at my um, evangelical Christian high school saying, I'm retiring, I'd really like you to come and take my place. And it was so difficult to make that decision. I didn't want to come back home. Not that I didn't love being with my parents, but I just loved Roanoke so much. Um, but I agreed to do it. And I came home um, to the Akron area and started teaching at that school and just found myself wanting to be out and about again within the first two months and not ready to settle down to a teaching schedule of <laughs> every nine months teaching the same thing. And so I sort of took under my wing a young lady who was struggling in her faith and, and kind of needed a mentor and started taking her to church with me at my the Anglican church I was raised in um, was back there again. And I would take her, take her to church with me on Sundays. And um, suddenly the school year was over. I was ready to move up to Cleveland to take an internship um, and live in Little Italy. And I was so excited about it. And um, I went to church one Sunday and there was this guy there that I'd never seen before. <laughs> um, but I have to say, um, he looked very similar to how he looks now, <laughs> only with longer hair because he'd been living as a bachelor all this time and was convinced he was going to be a bachelor forever. He didn't have marriage on his um, agenda. Um, but I came back the next week. Um, well, we, we went out for coffee several times on Sundays through that time. And Ashley, the young woman that I, that I was taking to church with me, was commenting about how I was hopeless and I was never going to get married. And um, this young it man. It sounds too. like the start of one of those Hallmark movies. <laughs> and you've never met a more anti-Hallmark couple. Um, but uh, so she was making just shameless remarks. Um, and I had to go away for a couple of weeks. I went to a conference and I did some other things with my summer um, and came back and suddenly this had turned into <laughs> short hair contacts and a goatee. Um, and I, I looked at him one Sunday and I said, at our tiny Anglican church, and I said, you're shorn. And he laughed and he said he was, and would I like to go get coffee again? And um, I suddenly found myself having these fascinating conversations that mm. brought together all of my undergraduate study. Um, we had been interested in the same things, reading the same things. Um, I was reading 
um, Augustine City of God in preparation for a program mm -hmm. I was going to go do up in Canada mm -hmm. um, at a tiny little college up there. For me, it was going to be postgraduate. For a lot of the kids who were there, it was it was sort of pre-college. Um, I was going for very different reasons. I wanted to supplement my undergraduate education with a theological framework that I had not had in undergraduate. And the next thing I know, I'm having these amazing conversations <laughs> with this gentleman who was able to walk me through all of these things because he'd read them. Um, and I was just ecstatic. This was wonderful. But we realized I was headed to Canada. He was headed to New Jersey um, to start a doctoral program. And I realized how very upset that made me. And looking back, um, my mom knew <laughs> before I did um, where we were headed. Um, but at the end of that summer, um, after having told Ashley that, in fact, I was not hopeless and I'd begun dating this nice young man. Um, which she did not believe. Which she did not believe, which <laughs> says something either about me or about her, I don't know. Um, I was headed to Canada and he was headed to New Jersey and I was so very upset. Um, but I'd like Matt to talk about what we did in those years that he was at, in New Jersey and I was in, in Canada and then in law school in Northern Virginia, where I only stayed for one year before I transferred back to Akron, Ohio, okay. again. <laughs> before I, I'm gonna interrupt a couple again. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure that the audience, because of lack of experience like myself, always appreciate the difference in the high, low church Anglican mm. Episcopalian that you mm -hmm. both are talking about, right? Mm -hmm. right? I, mean, I mean, we can get it, what it looks like on paper, theology and all that, right. but from an experiential standpoint, often it's the language mm -hmm. and the music. And right. so much more, yes. Yeah. I'll let but, Matt take that. You know, one way I would describe it just quickly is say, as an, as an Anglican, you could be 99% Baptist or you can be 99 cent Catholic. <laughs> yeah. um, th there is, is so much in terms of, you know, even going into the churches, what's front and center? Is it an altar? Well, obviously then you're going more towards the Catholic side. Is it a pulpit? You can have that, where communion celebrated once a month, if that. Uh, and so it's just a wide spectrum. There's a charismatic movement in, in <laughs> Anglicanism that we had mentioned, uh, that you had mentioned earlier. So uh, we were both, I think, um, maybe Elizabeth, uh, slightly less so, but we were both moving uh, definitely in that more Catholic perspective there on the on Anglicanism. And so, um, you know, especially Elizabeth is a, a, a wonderful uh, vocalist and appreciates polyphony and, and all of that. Mm -hmm. And so musically, she mm -hmm. um, approved uh, or, or very much enjoyed some of the very, you know, intricate Anglican chant and whatnot, which again, that tends to put you more, oh, you're the, you know, you're on yeah. the Catholic side of Anglicanism. So uh, that, that's kind of what, it, in brief, what we're talking about you know the the uh, more Anglo-Catholic or high church people are tend to be uh, very much into um, you know their, their liturgies um, would look um, would be full of the smells and the bells and all of that and the uh, the more low church Anglicans would be more of a preaching based service somewhat that a, that a Baptist or an evangelical would say well I can see something of similarity in that would the higher Anglican be more inward the lower Anglican more evangelistic I think that's fair overall but, but, yeah. I mean, that's probably true for mm -hmm. Catholics, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. The, the Anglican Catholic Church I attended when I was um, in college and driving out to Alexandria, um, it was actually the cathedral, effectively. The, the oh. bishop was there, who was then the archbishop, um, and they still did morning prayer one Sunday a month with no communion, with no communion service. Yeah. So they were fairly high church in that they had the bishop, but they still had that very Protestant one Sunday a month we do morning prayer. I think that's partly yeah. the Southern influence too, yes. and the Episcopalianism. Agreed. That, yeah, but, yeah, that uh, strict 1928 Book of Common Prayer. I mean, other Anglican parishes that, that actually the one that we, we met in, I mean, they did Corpus Christi processions, they mm -hmm. did uh, a confession, uh, rosary, you know. Stations of the Cross. All of this, yeah. So it, it's so a, a lot of Catholic thing. stuff. Mm -hmm. Oh, very much so. You've already gotten over. You know, in terms of your journey in the long run, you were really getting close. The, the only thing I would say is you can take it or leave it. 
as an Anglican. It's called pious can, opinion. Pious opinion, and you can ignore a lot of that. You're not, no one really encourages you to go to confession. No one encourages you to pray the rosary. It's available, but you can be, I wouldn't say you could be low church in a high church parish, but it, it, it's very, whatever you want, very individualistic right. uh, in terms of its it, it, spirituality. Not necessary. Not necessary. Oh. Right. Not necessary. And right. I, I remember Father Dwight Longnecker one time mm -hmm. talking about um, Anglicans using the term the real presence of Christ. Mm -hmm. They're the same words, but we mean different things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they can mean different things on that long span of Anglicanism. Mm -hmm. You know? Yes. Or you can dismiss them entirely. You can yeah. dismiss it entire Talk yeah. about dismissing. We're going to take a break right now, okay? And then we'll come back. That way you'll know how much we got left uh, in the program. But it's been wonderful. Let's take a break. Matt and Elizabeth Eggers are our guests. And we're going to take a break and be right back. Welcome back to The Journey Home. I'm your host, Marcus Grodi, and our guests tonight are Matt and Elizabeth Akers. All right. It was the baton over here, right? <laughs> it was. Over here. All right, let's pick her up. <laughs> so um, we met, as, as we said, over the summer, um, and so this would have been um, 2002, just to kind of give us a date to, to anchor that on. And Elizabeth was headed um, off to school in Canada. I was headed off to school in New Jersey. And um, it was very difficult. We'd only known each other a uh, couple of weeks, a uh, couple, uh, months. couple months, well, over the summer at, at that point. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it was really difficult. But in thinking about how God works, I think it was providential because we had such wonderful conversations long distance over the phone and developed uh, mm -hmm. such a, a deep relationship because mm -hmm. uh, we, we didn't see each other for months at a time, of course, um, but uh, we were able to talk and we talked a lot about our schoolwork because um, I was at uh, Drew University out of New Jersey pursuing a degree in English literature, but I continued the study in theology. So every semester I was taking one course in theology or church history. Um, and uh, while I was there, I was in um, class actually with some of the, the scholars working on the ancient Christian commentary series. So there was that emphasis on patristics there. And so I was taking courses on post nicene Fathers, Russian Orthodoxy, um, and Elizabeth and her program, it was uh, a lot of theology. And so we were discussing the works we were Were you reading. studying or teaching? I was studying. I was okay. also <coughs> teaching Latin at the time, but okay. But you were up in Canada studying, right. okay. studying right. mostly. Yeah. So um, we just it, it just had some wonderful conversations. Um, now that we have four little ones at home, I miss those conversations <laughs> because we never have uninterrupted <laughs> conversations. But uh, but it, it really did help us form a, a very strong bond uh, early on. And so um, we did see each other a couple of times throughout the next year, and then uh, we came back together again to Ohio and. The summer of 2003, um, got engaged, and then uh, we got married the summer of 2004. And so again, most of that time, though, we'd actually been physically, we'd been apart, living in different areas. But um, we got uh, we got married, and we settled back um, in Ohio and resumed attending the parish that uh, we had met at this this uh, um, small Anglican parish. It was very high church, and um, I uh, started teaching Latin, ironically, um, at an at an evangelical school, um, high school. And um, we, uh, I was continuing working on my, my doctoral studies and uh, at, at a distance doing the, the comprehensive exams and then started working on the dissertation and Elizabeth's uh, in law school. Um, but um, it, at, our, at our church, it began to take more and more responsibility on it at church and more and more involved. And uh, um, really, again, it was, it was small, but uh, as I started serving and becoming more involved, um, you probably know how that is in those small churches. Uh, <laughs> you continue to get more and more involved. So we were um, um, becoming with, with um, not trying to make ourselves sound more important than we were, but we were two of the youngest people in the church and also probably two of the more involved. Uh, yeah. and, and so um, we, we continued um, in, in, that, uh, in that direction at, at St. Mary's. And I was also, again, as I said, I was teaching at an evangelical school. and. Um, 
I began to see that more and more the theology um, that um, this, this Anglicanism that again, I, I think it's fair to say at least I was growing higher and higher in my Anglicanism, higher church. And there were some more um, discrepancies with the evangelical theology that I encountered um, on a day-to-day -day basis at the school. And so that um, was in many ways a good thing because it helped me sharpen my faith more and, yeah. and continue to read. And I also saw some similarities. Some of the evangelicals were very interested in the church fathers, which I continued to be interested in the fathers. Um, but then um, as we uh, continued on then, um, we had, um, uh, we began to uh, believe, um, we attended some of the, um, um, the Rockford uh, summer schools um, that were, um, these were summer schools put on by the Rockford Institute um, and, and Chronicles Magazine is affiliated with them. But um, I'd started subscribing to the magazine and it's um, partly uh, political, a lot of cultural stuff, but a lot of the people affiliated with it uh, were Roman Catholic. Some of them, some of them were high church Anglican, uh, one or two high church Lutherans, but mostly Roman Catholic. And um, I, I was fascinated by a lot of the articles in, in Chronicles and then they talked about the summer school, and so uh, I believe Elizabeth is a present to me, uh, uh, signed us up for the summer school the first year. And this would have been uh, 2008, I believe, 2008 that we, that we first attended this. And um, the, the, the summer school was actually on the American West, um, but um, the, the lectures were fascinating throughout the day, but the dinners in the evening, talking with, uh, there were a number of Catholic priests in attendance, and we were talking with a number of the, again, just the scholars who were there were Catholic. And so um, they were very intrigued by our high church Anglicanism, but also, um, you know, encouraging us to really think about Catholicism. And um, maybe I'll let Elizabeth talk about the second summer school we attended because that one we began, or I began to think <laughs> much more seriously about their critiques of Anglicanism and much more about are we in the wrong place here in Anglicanism? Up, up in this point, you've never really thought about becoming Catholic. Well, I thought we were Catholic, to be quite frank. Okay, that, as as I, Anglicans, I thought, well, we have about, all yeah. the blessings of Catholicism without... High Church Lutherans, High Church Anglicans, often in that right. same camp. Yes. Yep. Yeah. yep. That's where we were. Um, and as we drove home from that first summer school, we talked about why we were right. <laughs> and then we had a baby, and we, we went through a very difficult time. Um, actually, I will say my husband had bought me a book called The Rosary Handbook, and mm -hmm. I'd been learning to pray the rosary because I felt very called to do that. I, I couldn't put aside this idea that there was something very lacking in my faith. I had the father and I had the son, but I had no mother. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. was, um, I began to feel that lack. And so Matt bought me The Rosary Handbook. Um, our dear dear priest uh, who married us and who was so instrumental in our faith and in our progress toward the more high church um, perspective. Um, blessed a rosary for me. We were given a rosary actually by one of the ladies in the church who had and been- for you audience out there, Anglicans pray the rosary once <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, that's what yeah. you're saying. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Um, we've been given a rosary by, by a lady in the parish who was a former Roman Catholic nun and then left the convent left mm -hmm. religious life and married and became an Anglican. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I started into this, um, but I was still convinced that Catholicism was not, you know, Roman Catholicism was not yeah. in my future. Um, and then we went to the next summer school and ha heard a hysterical exchange between a very sweet Presbyterian lady and a very <laughs> wonderful um, Catholic professor um, in which she concluded, well, I guess I could be Catholic. And he said, well, of course you could. That's what Jesus wants. <laughs> um, and <laughs> we thought it was so funny. I thought it was funny. And as we were driving home, I realized my husband was serious that he was looking at Catholicism. And I was, I was gobsmacked. I could not believe that this was coming down the pike. Um, but as we talked about it more and more, I saw that what was drawing him was the life question. Mm -hmm. There was no um, answer to the life question within Anglicanism. They were so wrapped up in pious opinion and they didn't have a magisterium and so there were a lot of very crucial issues that were left up to the laity. Um, well, and if I could just break in there and say with the, the 1930 Lambeth Conference, I believe, yeah. you know, that was when the, the, the birth control issue came was, in. Was that an annual or a biannual conference? I forget what that was. I'm not sure to tell you. But the my truth. point for the audience is this is the 
worldwide oh, annual the, gathering yes. mm -hmm. of, yeah. the, of the powers Anglican that be communion. all the together whole, right. to decide. Right, and they allowed, um, that was I believe the first instance of them saying, well, birth control in, in, in some cases, right? Um, by 19, in the 1960s, 30 years later, you know, the Episcopal Church, the Anglican Church is just, it's wide open then. Well, birth control right. for everybody, you know, we abortion, okay. Um, and so, you know, I looked at the, at the consistency, because that, that always bothered me. I was, I was always pro-life, um, my, my, my Baptist father, wonderful, you know, pro-life man, but I was never taught, again, any of the context of it, and well, what about birth control? And I, I couldn't really, I could find very uh, good explanation in Catholicism, even if it's a hard teaching, but it, it makes perfect sense, right? Mm -hmm. And it's logical, it's consistent, it's scriptural, it's, it's historical and everything else. But and if so, you're left with the Bible alone, you've got a problem with, with arguing. Yes. And then in the Episcopal Church, which eventually became more of a democratic decision at the yes. annual gatherings, it isn't Bible alone, it's democratic. Where you, the trajectory is there. Yes, mm -hmm. right, right. And that's what you were seeing, the yes. trajectories. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so that was one of the chief things. I mean, Catholic social teaching in general, um, you know, I, I, I um, was reading in distributism at the time as well. So uh, Chesterton and Bellock, I said, oh, this sounds really interesting. And then I'm realizing, well, they actually drew that from Pope Leo XIII. They, you know, they didn't think this up wholesale. That's a papal encyclical. And so the Catholic social teaching, um, I was looking and I was saying, this is tremendous. And when we, when we came to the life issue too, just that was very instrumental in yeah. saying, okay, this makes sense. And, and the best parts of, of Anglicanism, I guess I came to the conclusion, are drawn not from the Anglican tradition, but from the Catholic tradition, the Roman Catholic tradition. So. Well, and as we had, had found ourselves in a very unhappy situation uh, just before that conference, um, our dear, dear priest passed away. And that was, it was, he was able to give our first child a blessing in utero, mm -hmm. but he passed away on a Friday. She was born then on Tuesday. Um, and so that was very hard. Um, the church started to flounder without him because he was a very big presence in every way. Um, he was, you know, over six feet, five inches tall, and he was just a, a mountain. And, and in his personality and in his, his kindness, and he brought us along. Um, and that was very hard. And we began to be, I would say, unhappy in our church. Matt had a lot of responsibility on his shoulders. He was ordained to the diaconate that mm. summer. Mm. Um, and suddenly a whole lot of what seemed to me stuff that shouldn't be his responsibility suddenly was. We were without mm. a priest. We were mm. in the midst of then trying to find a priest and he was involved in all of that. Then he was made a deacon under that priest, but it, it mm. just became a very unhappy situation. And we realized things were not as we wanted them to be, but we had nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think was causing Matt to ask these questions and what was causing me to say, oh, no, I'm not ready. Because all I could see in my mind was, how am I going to tell my father if we become Catholic? I can't tell my dad. I, yeah. I don't know what that will do to him. And there was no question in my mind it wouldn't go well. Um, and yeah. that's where we were as we drove home from Rockford, Illinois that summer. Yeah, and I think it helped that. I was going to say, your dad probably wouldn't be really happy to hear the news either. Uh, he was no. not. No. It, it, even just conceiving of the possibility of that. Uh, you know. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. Um, that that the, um, the fundamentalist background. You know, there's there's still the <laughs> reformational idea that you know uh, you're not you're not even a Christian if you're Catholic. Uh, so it's it's. Um, it was it was difficult. Um, even within Anglicanism, uh, there were a few things he could grasp at, like the King James Version. <laughs> he was a 1611 King James Version only, um, although it's interesting that the 1611 contains the so-called Apocrypha, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, <laughs> some of those, it's, Oops. yes, yeah. But, um, you know, it, in, I think, too, even as we were talking earlier about the spread within Anglicanism, we saw it even with the transfer from um, this, this priest who really did this Anglican priest who really influenced me, um, who was very kind of small C Catholic, you know, um, he would, he made the, the statement to me one time, he said, um, anybody with a high Marian doctrine, it is almost guaranteed that they have a high view of Christology. He said, if they don't have a high Marian doctrine, I'm going to suspect their Christology right away. 
And so you, you can see he influenced me greatly in that direction. Wow. The, the new priest that came in was much more on the, the lower church spectrum. And so kind of getting back to that issue of authority, you know, we had such a spread even in that, that church that I um, began to get a little um, concerned about, um, you know, the fact that we've got, um, okay, high church, low church, what, who has, who's determining this? Is it the congregation? Is it just the priest? Who's, who's making this determination of what we believe? Right. You know, I was going to tell you, a former guest on this program said that very thing about Mary and Christology. Oh, really? and you know who that was? Huh. Graham Leonard, huh? the second guest of the jury home. He was the former huh? Bishop of London, the Anglican Bishop really? of London. Oh, my and God. that was what convinced, one of the things that convinced him to be open to the Catholic Church because of that very wow. issue, yeah. recognizing the necessity of Mary in Christology. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, well, my sure. father always used to refer to it as the great Marian heresy. Oh. <laughs> so I knew where we were headed. I couldn't tell him I prayed a rosary. He would have been horrified. Um, at this point, I was veiling during Mass, but I saw it as um, a sign of um, obedience to to Christ right. and to my husband as the head of the scripture. church, scripture. Uh, as the head of the family, right. um, the scriptural references, absolutely. I had no concept of real presence, none. Um, <laughs> and so we, I was not okay with this necessarily, but one thing I've learned about my husband is that he will look at a situation and he will study it from all aspects and he will thoroughly examine his own beliefs in light of what he has studied. Um, it's something that I admire very much about him. Um, and I've watched him do it um, politically, and I've watched him do it in terms of even getting married. You know, he wasn't <laughs> expecting to even be married, right? Probably takes him years to buy a new car. Oh, it's <laughs> awful. It does. Yeah, well, the last one he got rid of was 17 years old, so. <laughs> I'm cheap, too. Yeah. <laughs> Not where I'm concerned. Um, but it was, it, it took me remembering all of those things that I admired about him and all of the ways that he'd shown me in the past that he was not going to do something rash to remind myself that I could follow him, I could trust him. And that's, I don't know how I did it because that's not my nature. My parents will tell you how bullheaded I am, but I trusted him and I watched as he continued this journey and as we did, I'll be honest, we faced losing a job mm -hmm. because of it. Um, I was pregnant um, very shortly after with our we second started, child. With our second child, yeah. very shortly after we started this journey of examination. Um, and you know what? One of the things that brought me around was being involved in a, in a Catholic mom's group. They let me in, even though I wasn't Catholic. <laughs> they didn't know what an Anglican Catholic was, but they were willing to find <laughs> out. Um, and I got into a Johnette Bankovic. Bible study, oh, um, sure. one of her Women of Grace studies, um, the Full of Grace. And the thing that just struck me was that these studies were all about scripture, tradition, um, church history, and the church fathers, studying the liturgy. Mm -hmm. There was, I don't remember any single question that said, how do you feel about the scripture? which is one of the things that bothered me most about the Protestant studies I'd been in. There was no question of how I felt about it, but there were a lot of questions about how does this affect your life? How does learning this about this saint or this mm -hmm. church doctrine or this church father, mm -hmm. how does this affect your life? And I was suddenly coming around to what my husband had been very gently teaching me all that mm -hmm. time. And, and I remember um, during this whole time, there was a, um, I, I was again reading about distributism, and um, there was a, uh, I was looking on a, on a website about distributism, and there was an advertisement for um, St. Sebastian's Church in Akron, Ohio, that a, which is right down the street from us, that a Hilaire Belloc impersonator was coming and going to you know, <laughs> sp speak as if he were Belloc. And so I, I called up the priest, uh, uh, Father Valenchek, whom I, I did not know at this point, but I said, I'm not Catholic, but I, could I come to this um, talk? And he kind of laughed and he said, well, anybody who knows who Belloc is is welcome to this talk. And now I'm <laughs> impressed you know who he is. And so um, I went to the, the, the talk and um, actually I believe a couple of us from our Anglican parish went over there because we were in a little book study and, and actually reading Belloc. And um, 
I had a very warm reception from, from mm -hmm. Father Valenchak. And then, again, just in the providence of things, we started seeing Father Valenchak around town after that. So we were at a Shakespeare play a couple weeks later, and I, I see him there. And we're out to eat at a restaurant, and we see him there. And so um, we had a lot in common, the two of us, just in terms of our interest in literature and theology and whatnot. So we started right away. Um, we connected you know, just on a friendship level, and so started talking with him more and more, all the while. Um, this, uh, we're, we're feeling discontented at the, you know, at the Anglican Church, and so um, Father Valenchak and Saint Sebastian was big influence, and and he at that time even I, I believe that was not too long after um, there had been a closure of some churches in the the Cleveland Diocese, in which Saint Sebastian resides, and there had been a a parish that had um, the Latin Mass at it, and it had closed down. And St. Sebastian's recently had, you know, extended an invitation to that community to say, hey, you can, you can use St. Sebastian. And so Father Valencheck, uh, in talking with me, said, I think you might be interested in, in the Latin Mass, <laughs> uh, which, which there was, of course. And so then, that all you guys started. Both knew Latin. We yep. did. We One thing. Yes. Time. There you go. Yeah. 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 So um, it, it all just um, was, was fitting together. And uh, but as Elizabeth had said, one huge issue here, and, and while I try to be faithful. And, and try to trust in God. I also, um, unfortunately, tend to be also, I guess, very practical and say, well, wait a minute, I've got to do this myself. And I had this job situation where uh, I was teaching at a school that had said, you know, a lot of good people there, but if, if you do this, you know, you, you're not going to be renewed um, contract. And so uh, we had to make a decision, right? And um, one of the, the uh, Groups that I actually um, contacted, that was the first time I made contact with the Coming Home Network. Mm -hmm. uh, we, well, we both did because mm -hmm. both were very, you know, concerned about this. What do we do? And uh, I can't say enough about how helpful the Coming Home Network was um, in helping put together a resume, um, you know, helping me um, just uh, brainstorm about ideas. Mm -hmm. And um, so that was um, on um, Christmas Eve. I got a call. Uh, we had already actually, we started attending. Um, um, St. Sebastian. Officially left our church yeah. at that point, and yes, my parents we, yeah. were not yeah. happy. Uh, yeah, 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 we had yeah. to tell them. We told them at a Bob Evans, actually, that we were leaving. <laughs> we waited until the night before the our last. Those outside of Ohio. Yeah. yeah, we waited until the last Saturday before our last Sunday. And my father, God bless him, he tried. He tried, but his he just threw his hands up and walked away from the table, and that was hard. Yeah. yeah. Which is. To a certain extent, we can understand because if you don't have a file folder in your mind for Catholicism, yep. if you don't have the data, mm -hmm. it's hard to make the connection. And if you grew up that it was culturally different, it's yeah. other. Yeah. 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 And so uh, we started um, actually attending the church. So that would have been November of 2011. And um, you know, but still had no answer on the job thing. What was what was going to happen? Um, and I was due with a baby in February. In February. This was which number? Two. Two. Okay. Number yeah. two. But um, you know, again, partly through the Coming Home Network's help. And on um, Christmas Eve of 2011, I, I get a call from a from another place and say, "Hey, we uh, we want to extend this job, um, uh, you know, opportunity to you." And so um, January came, and I was able to transition to that job. And uh, February, we came home to the to the Catholic Church. So we um, we were confirmed by um, a wonderful priest who actually says the Latin Mass at Saint. Sebastian regularly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he confirmed us on February 4th, and that night some dear, dear friends um, who were with us for that confirmation, drove up from Columbus for that confirmation. Um, we asked them to be our son's godparents, and he was born the next Saturday. So he waited a oh. week so that I could receive <laughs> the Eucharist before, because we'd gone without receiving from the time we'd left our yeah. parish on the first Sunday in Advent um, until February 4th. Well, some might say, well, you know, that you don't want to mess up family, so why not just stay Anglican? Mm. I mean, uh, when you look back, or even now, mm. why Catholic? 
You know, and I think with my own father, because we, you know we, we've we've talked a little bit about Elizabeth's father's reaction. My my father's reaction was somewhat similar. I, I told him he got up and left the room and came back maybe half an hour later and said, uh, "What's the weather like outside?" And that was that was it. Never have talked really about that gotcha. since. But. Um, you know, and I, so I think that he probably <laughs> would not want to hear this, but I think in many ways, um, many of the things he taught me and instructed me in, going back to that, you know, that, that strong biblical foundation, that strong reverence for church, for prayer, for mm -hmm. looking at how you view the world through a Christian lens, um, and that's what I'm living out now. So I, I don't, I don't see it necessarily. I mean, yes, it's a, it's a break, like you're saying, on the on the, the the familial level in terms of, well, I don't like that. But I, I think I'm actually staying true. It's a little bit. I, I believe uh, we've mentioned Newman before, um, but I believe John Henry Newman. He kind of talked about his evangelical Anglican upbringing and said, well, you know, there's still a lot from that that I have today. And so that's kind of my answer, at least, <laughs> more at the theological level, I guess. Um, that that I, I have absorbed those lessons I was taught, and this is a continuation, yeah. not a break. There's that difficult statement by our Lord that does talk about sometimes dividing families. Yes. The yes. point of it wasn't dividing families. The point of it was truth. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And let me say, there's no division with my father now. Yeah. We just don't talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's but but I will never say a bad word against him because he loves us and he loves his grandbabies and you know yeah. he's you know, we have two more now and he's happy being grandpa um, but we just don't talk about that. But we see both sets of grandparents weekly, or my father yeah. and. Uh, but you're also both saying you're here because of their faithfulness. Absolutely, mm -hmm. that's yes. what I want him most to understand. Yeah. Yeah. I'm here because of. The, the truth that you taught me and the fact that you taught me to examine and you taught me to to pray and be faithful and that's what I did. And in answer to your question, why Catholicism? Every Sunday when I walk into our traditional Latin Mass and I see my little girls in their veils and their, you know, <laughs> I understand now why I'm doing that. I understand real presence and I understand the fullness of the Holy Family. Hmm. I understand that I do have a mother. Um, and I understand it more fully in the Catholic Church than I ever did in the Anglican Church. God was just getting me ready for that. Um, I look, and you've seen those images of all of the saints around the altar as the sacrifice of the Mass is offered. And I understand that now. I see those saints in day-to-day -day life. And the sacramentalism of Catholicism has opened my eyes to see my faith daily in ways that I never did before. Um, and my children see it now. Um, they see the sacramentalism and they understand better than I ever did um, about the truth. And, and that as you, the issue of life and morality oh, yes. and all these mm -hmm. other issues really open up the eyes to those that are, are awakened by grace to the damage of democratic theology. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. when you're in the midst of the pressures of the world around us. And that, that's one of the things, too, about, about Catholicism as well. I mean, that, you know, attending the Mass, I, I see that meeting of heaven and earth. I mean, it draws us up out of the, the mundane. And mm -hmm. from my background in, in a lot of Protestantism, you know, it was so focused um, on this world. And it just, it, it doesn't have the categories of saying, hey, um, we're actually inhabitants of another realm, really. And so, to me, that, that time on, on Sunday, and again, I, I you know, that our, our tradition is a Latin Mass, and I, I can see that, that mystery, that sacredness there, that mm -hmm. otherworldliness, um, that this is an event that, that can't be explained just in rational terms, right? This is something beyond, you know, the, the ex, it's extraordinary, if you will. But um, th that's something that's been so critical to me and to try to teach the kids as well, our, our children, that there is, there is more to this, um, this life than just what you, you see in front of you, right? And that um, we, we can enter into the divine realm. You know, it came to me this last year in a really powerful way, having visited a, a, a non-Catholic church and the mm -hmm. Catholic church on the same Sunday mm -hmm. and asking myself, how would I describe it to somebody, what's different here? Hmm. What's, this, what's the essential difference here? I mean, we could make a long list, but it came down to the difference is the priest, because that priest brings us Jesus. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. the other church, you might be a great preacher. Right. right. But here we have the, 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 the body, blood, soul, divinity of, of our Lord. 
it's the difference between word little w and word yep. big w yeah. And that's one of the things that we've talked with the kids about just in passing. One day our daughter asked us and she said, Daddy, why don't we cross ourselves when we go in front of a Protestant church? Because we have to cross ourselves when we go in front of a Catholic church. And I, I said, I, I didn't mean anything really by this, but I just said, well, honey, Jesus isn't there. Jesus is, is in the Catholic church, body, blood, soul, and divinity. And, um, you know, I think that that just illustrates some of the difference. I mean, we do believe, and, and my own father would say, yes, he's not in my church, not at all in the way you He's there by he faith and by by grace right, and right. by all of that right. good. But not the way, not yeah. the deep way that we're talking about. Well, and I've watched my children go to adoration, and before we leave, um, I'm going to have trouble. <laughs> before we leave, they say goodbye to Jesus. Hmm. And I, there's nothing like it. And I never had that experience growing up or that idea that Jesus was there in that sense, in a, you know, in the churches that I grew up in. Yeah. Thank you both Thank you. Thank you. for joining us here on the journey home. And God bless you both and your family and your continued you. service. And thank you for sharing thank your journey you. with thank us you. here. And uh, those of you watching, thank you very much for joining us on this episode of the journey home. I do pray that Matt and Elizabeth's journey is an encouragement to you. God bless you. See you next week.